Hi. Today I want to talk to you about Friedrich Hayek's critique of John Kenneth Galbraith's argument in the affluent society that he calls the dependence effect. Hayek is one of the greatest economists of the 20th century, author of The Road to Serfdom, the classic critique of socialism. Hayek is a champion of free markets and an opponent of central planning. Galbraith, on the other hand, was one of the 20th century's great advocates of central planning and one of the great critics of the free market. So it's an important debate. This is not a footnote. Under the question of responsibilities to consumers, in a certain sense, it is a reflection of the greatest economic divide of the 20th century. When we look at the details of the argument, I think we'll get a better understanding of what motivates each side to take the position that it does. In another video, I've talked about Galbraith's argument and what the dependence effect really is. The core idea there is that wants depend on the process by which they're satisfied. And when that happens, we have what he calls a contrived want. In general, satisfying contrived wants is not something we can expect to lead to improvements in welfare, to the degree, at any rate, to which satisfying genuine wants does lead to improvements in welfare. Hayek is suspicious of this argument and gives a number of criticisms. I'm going to track some of his criticisms, but also try to go into a little more detail to see that there are complexities in Galbraith's argument that aren't evident on the surface. So let's start with the question of what these terms mean. What is a genuine desire? or, in Galbraith's terms, an urgent desire. But I think that's, as I've explained in another video, a red herring. It's not about time frame. It's really about the authenticity or genuine character of the desire. So let's just use the term genuine. And he thinks that all genuine desires are original and not contrived. He doesn't define original or contrived, but we can clearly identify paradigm cases of each of those. A great example of an original desire is the one I have intrinsically, innately, you might say. I have desires for food, for water, for shelter. These are things that are innate in me as a human being. They're clearly original, if anything is. Contrived desires are ones that are produced. And the feeling is, well, they're ones I'm manipulated into having. But at any rate, they are ones that are produced by someone else. Well, in between these two paradigm cases might be all sorts of other things. So one of the things that Hayek focuses on most particularly is a class of things that are dependent on the activities and preferences of other people. But these desires are not ones that seem to be the result of manipulation. They don't seem to be morally objectionable in any way. People have desires for and an appreciation of art, music, literature, film, all sorts of other things of that kind. They care about the respect of their peers. They care about being esteemed, thought well of by other people. They're concerned with things like friendship and love, all of which are not original in the sense of independent of other people's activities, attitudes, desires, and so on. They're dependent on those. They are all socially involved, you might say socially dependent. They're, in most cases, maybe not all, but in many cases at any rate, they are things that are culturally conditioned. I could not have a fondness for broke music unless people had produced it and there had been a chain of transmission of that music down to me. And so there are lots of things like that that are in some sense produced culturally. They are cultural products or social products or the results of other people's activity or maybe dependent on other people's attitudes and activity. And it doesn't seem as if there's anything wrong with such desires, or you want to say they're inferior in any way, that they have a, a, a worse normative status than desires that are really innate in us, and so on. Now, I think that there is one way of taking Galbraith's writing that suggests that, yes, all of these belong on the contrived, on the produced side. And if that's right, then it seems as if the class of genuine desires is very narrow indeed maybe food, shelter, water, a few other core things that are basic to our animal natures, but there wouldn't be much else. We would think in terms of maybe Maslow's hierarchy and think that, well, once you get above the few basic levels, then it all looks like it's contrived in the sense of produced. But maybe Galbraith means, no, 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 I mean the kind of thing that is produced by a particular person. Now here we have to be careful 
because after all, J.S. Bach did produce the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, and in general, people in particular have published the books of Bach's music that I have read, have written the biographies of Bach that I have read, and so forth. And so they have been produced by particular people, and each stage of that transmission is something that was accomplished by the activities of particular people. If that's the idea, it's hard to say how we are actually going to exclude a very, very broad range of human activity. Well, it turns out, of course, that in Galbraith's argument, there's a certain kind of cultural production that really worries him, namely advertising. For now, let's just assume that he can somehow give us a sense of contrived that allows us to keep the value of our cultural products, but to cast suspicion on certain other kinds of desires that are the result of manipulation, let's say. That should be a clear-cut case. If I'm really manipulated and des desiring something, then yes, maybe satisfying it is really not an improvement of my welfare. So let's suppose we can characterize something like that and move on. The second premise is that companies sell by advertising. Well, as we pointed out in the other video, not always true, but in general true. Certainly, most of the time, normally, that's true. Third premise, advertising contrives wants. That's the point of it, to produce a desire for the product. Well, again, if we mean by contrivance something like manipulation, it seems as if that's awfully strong. In effect, we're saying advertising is normally manipulative. And some ads surely are, but it seems like a harsh indictment of the entire field. What is clear is that advertising does produce desires. That's part of the point of it, to really produce a desire to purchase the product or the service. And so advertising produces desires. That seems fair enough. Companies sell by advertising. Advertising produces desires. So companies sell by producing desires, desires for their product. It seems reasonable. We have to be careful, though. Is the production of that kind of desire essential to advertising or not? Well, presumably it is, right? I mean, the point of advertising my product is to get people to buy it. And in order to get them to buy it, I have to get them to want to buy it. So I have to produce that desire. So although I think there's a little bit of a missing premise here, it's not just an accidental byproduct or an accidental means that advertising produces these desires. It does that by its very essence. That's the point of it. But I think that's plausible enough, as long as we mean something neutral, like produce the desires, rather than actually something stronger, like manipulate people into having those desires. There shouldn't, in other words, be something negative normatively that we already read into that premise. But let's take a look at the conclusions, then, that Galbraith tries to draw. The first of those conclusions, the intermediate conclusion, is that companies produce in order to meet contrived desires. Companies produce, in other words, in order to meet the desires they produce. Does that follow? Here I think Hayek is suspicious, and reasonably so. Because let's think of another kind of example, an analogy, but an argument that has exactly the same form. Authors write what they publish. How do they publish it? Well, by gaining the approval of editors and referees. So suppose we concluded from that that authors write to satisfy the preferences of editors and referees. That's a rather cynical way of looking at writing. Now, writers do have to gain that approval in order to publish their stuff, at least before self-publishing they did. Does it follow that authors write in order to gain the approval of editors and referees? Well, that's a strange and rather cynical way of looking at writing. Most writers don't do that. They don't sit around and say, wow, I admire editors. I wish they thought well of me. Maybe I'll write something. And if they like it, maybe they'll admire me. That's not what's going on. And certainly the editor, the referee, is not manipulating me into writing anything. Instead, people write for a wide variety of reasons. They write to tell a story. They write to explain some concept or theory, to advocate a policy, to argue for something or against something. They write to report something. They write because they're interested in some topic and they hope that other people will share their interest. In short, they write something for a wide variety of different reasons to respond to a variety of needs, needs of other people and needs of their own. And then they hope to gain the approval of editors and referees in order to actually publish it and get it to the people they want to communicate with. 
but initially they have something they want to communicate. And then they think, this is how I communicate it. Well, what if we thought of companies in the same way? And clearly, this is Hayek's picture. It's not Galbraith's picture of, hmm, how will we make money as a company? Let's see, let's produce a product and then produce the desire for that product. It's not like that. Instead, it's like the writer. The writer says, here's something I want to communicate. I think, how do I communicate it? Well, I could publish it. How do I publish it? I have to go through these gatekeepers. I better gain their approval. And so the writer does that. Maybe along the way, they shape some of the writing in order to gain the approval of editors and referees. But essentially, they're not writing in order to gain the approval of editors and referees. That's simply a step along the way. Well, companies analogously may say, I want to produce this product. I want to produce this work of art, let's say. Or maybe I want to respond to what I perceive as a need or a desire that people have. And then once I produce it, I think I've got to communicate this. How do I communicate it? In order to communicate it, I actually have to advertise now. And in advertising, I want to generate a desire to buy my product, just as the author wants to generate a desire on the part of a reader to read this stuff by actually publishing it, for example. The whole goal here is communication. So you might say the company, company's goal is sales. And yes, in the end, there has to be a desire on the reader's part to read the writing, on the consumer's part to buy the product. But the company isn't producing in order to meet this desire it's producing. It's producing because it thinks it has something valuable. And then it's trying to communicate its value to a potential audience. And yes, thereby producing a desire in the audience. If we think that the situation of the company is analogous to the author here, we're going to say, look, the whole goal here is not to produce a dependent desire. Aha, I've got a product. What will I do? I'll produce the desire for it. It's not like that. It's as if a writer said, hmm, I got this thing. I got to produce a desire in people to read my stuff. No, the person writes for a reason. Similarly, the company does what it does for a reason. It's trying to respond, typically, to a felt need or desire on people's part. But maybe it's simply something the person feels like they have to create. It's a desire on their part. The musician might create this music because they love the music. And they're not really looking to an audience. Just think about jazz, basically. <laughs> jazz musicians produce jazz largely for themselves. And the fact that some other people love it, that's great. But they don't really produce it to gain an audience. There's a sort of a meme that I've seen going around. The rock musician plays three chords in front of 3,000 people. The jazz musician plays 3,000 chords in front of three people. That's a little extreme. It's more like 300 chords in front of 30 people. But still, the jazz musician is not thinking, how do I manipulate people to get them to desire my product? They're doing something they love. They're doing something that they think does accomplish something, satisfies some kind of need that they have, or maybe that other people have, and then they try to communicate that. And in doing that, sometimes they gain an audience and gain a following. The same thing is true of companies. I may feel like, oh, I've got this great pizza recipe, and I love it, my friends love it, I want to bring this to the world. To do that, I have to communicate that. And so I hope, in, of course, to produce in people a desire for my pizza. But I'm not saying, hmm, got this pizza, what will I do with it? I think I'll manipulate people into desiring it. I start making the pizza because I think it's great pizza. Now notice what's happening here. And I think there's a subtle question now about the relationship between general desires and more specific desires. People have an authentic desire, surely a genuine desire for food and for good tasting food. I think I've got some food here that tastes great. Now, I communicate that to them, and I try to produce in them a desire for my pizza in particular. Well, does that desire that they have as a result count as a contrived desire or as a genuine desire? The desire for food is a genuine desire. I've produced that desire, so I suppose if we read contrived as simply the result of someone producing it through communicating something about a product, yes, that's a contrived desire. Is that less important to fulfill than the desire for food? Well, in one sense, obviously, yes. I mean, 
there are other ways of fulfilling your desire for food. So it's one thing to have a desire for that particular pizza. It's another thing to have a desire for pizza in general or for food in general. And so you might say, look, it's really vital that I get food. If I don't, I die. I won't die if I don't get that particular pizza or even any kind of pizza. And so in some sense, yes, the more specific desire is always less important than the more general desire. But on the other hand, it doesn't seem to have any lesser normative status. That is to say, we have no reason to think that my desire for that pizza is going to produce less satisfaction than just a generic desire for food. If anything, you might think it would go the other way. I have a desire for that kind of pizza because I have reason to believe it's really satisfying. Maybe I've had it before. Maybe I've just heard friends talk about it. Maybe I heard an ad that made me think, yeah, I want that pizza. But whatever it is, actually, there should be a greater probability that satisfying that desire is going to actually improve my welfare. And so it looks as if the normative conclusion that Galbraith is driving at here really doesn't follow. 